Apart from a couple outliers, most of the films that cover actual serial killers live in the B-movie category. In this video, I'm gonna take a look at four films made about Jeff Dahmer. And I'll tell you right now, a couple of them are hilariously bad, but maybe that makes them worth the watch. Hey people, welcome to Breakfast Cereal. My name's Josh, and on this channel, I make fun of criminals. Usually that happens to be serial killers. If you got a bit of a dark sense of humor, I think you found the right place. So make sure you murder that subscribe button. Real quick, before we get going, I will be talking about Dahmer films today. I won't be reviewing documentaries or even that latest 10 part series from Netflix. That said, I've got four Dahmer flicks I wanna tell you about today, so let's get into it. First up, we have Dahmer versus Gacy. <laughs> yeah, it's actually a movie. I don't even know where to begin with this one, to be honest. Released in 2010, and starring just a bunch of nobodies and Art Lafleur for like five minutes. According to Google, it's a horror slasher film, but I think you're absolutely insane if you don't consider this a comedy, and I'm pretty sure that's what the filmmakers, if you want to call them that, intended as well. It's completely off the rails. It's B-movie filmmaking at its best and worst at the same time. I said it in the intro that serial killer biopics are few and far between in A-list Hollywood. Well, <laughs> this definitely isn't A-list Hollywood. He just turned, walked right out of the place. I mean, I'm not even sure I would classify it as B. My famous fruit cart. I think we gotta go way down the alphabet for this one, like T. <laughs> T or something. And it certainly, certainly isn't anything close to resembling a biopic. But hey, that was never the intent of this. The plot? I mean, I guess technically there's a plot, kind of. In a top secret United States government lab, scientists are working to create the ultimate killer to combat the so-called super soldiers that Japan is on the brink of inventing. To create this ultimate killing machine, scientists have cloned the who's who of American serial killers. Charles Manson, Ted Bundy, Ed Gein, Casey, Tamar, Richard Ramirez, Richard Speck, all been cloned. So let me get this straight. The government's plan is to have Jeff Dahmer, John Wayne Gacy, and Charlie Manson and co. fight Japanese soldiers? Cool. Really horrible idea. It's just plain foolish. Anyways, <laughs> things of course take a turn when there's a fire at the lab and clones number five and seven escape. Clones five and seven are, you guessed it, Dahmer and Gacy. The two go their separate ways and make their way up the coast, killing innocent civilians along the way. It becomes apparent that their goal is to find the scientist who created them and, you know, do what serial killers do, kill them. There's tons of cheesy gore, bad acting, it appears the good doctor's experiments have turned against him. All the evidence does seem to point in that direction. And even some romance. So yeah, <laughs> crazy, right? <laughs> oh wait, there's also ninjas. A guy named Ringo who hears the voice of God telling him to kill the killers. Another super killer clone named X-13 who stabs people with corn. A fuck riddled montage. <laughs> and an appearance by Charlie Manson. You know, <laughs> after hearing myself say all that, I gotta say, I feel like you must be thinking to yourself, holy shit, that sounds like the coolest, most awesome fucking movie ever made. But let me assure you, it's really anything but. You know, sometimes a movie gets made that is just so bad that it's good like the room. How much is it? It'll be $18. Here you go, keep the change. Hi, doggy. You're my favorite customer. Thanks a lot, bye. But this, this is just bad. <laughs> it was insanely hard for me to make it through. I mean, I know that's what the filmmakers were kind of aiming for with this, but it, it, it just doesn't work. It's a super tough hour and 25 that climaxes with the crazy fight between these two juggernauts of serial killing. 
So is it worth watching? I, I don't know. Like, if you're after a movie that actually has anything to do with Jeff Dahmer, then, then no. But overall, I'm going to say, yeah, because I watched it for fuck's sakes. I shouldn't have to be the only one. I give Dahmer vs. Gacy two spoons. Oh yeah, I'm rating these movies out of 10. Two spoons out of 10. Coming back down to earth, next up we have My Friend Dahmer. Released in limited theaters in 2017, this psychological drama focuses on Jeff's high school years. It stars Ross Lynch as Dahmer, yet another actor with Disney Channel roots Boom, baby. to portray an infamous serial killer. I don't know, maybe it's an easier route to proving you're not all gumdrops and lollipops in the direction that Miley Cyrus took. Anyway, My Friend Dahmer is actually based on this graphic novel of the same name. It was written by Durf Bachter, who attended the same high school and befriended Jeff. Well, sort of. Do you want to come sit at our table? I mean, he actually more or less spent his time exploiting Jeff's insecurities and desire to be accepted by convincing him to make a spectacle of himself for the amusement of his classmates. The movie is a character study and spends a lot of time showing Dahmer struggling to fit in with his peers at high school. I got a trumpet you can blow. Overall, the performances are pretty solid, although Dahmer without the Wisconsin accent is a little weird. Uh, it'll be fun. If you know Dahmer's backstory, there's a lot here that will be familiar. The strained relationship of his parents, his fascination with roadkill, doing a Dahmer, <laughs> hitting trees with sticks, dumbbells, Classic Dahmer posture. Jeff wearing shirts that blend into the background. The jogger from Mad Men. The kid from Jumanji. Ellen's ex-girlfriend. And that time Dahmer stabbed a fish. What the hell? I said throw him back. And of course, there's also all the murders that Jeff committed. Uh, wait. No, there isn't. <laughs> the film sees us through Jeff's high school graduation and ends with him picking up Stephen Hicks. Hey, hello. Who, as we all know, would become his first victim. So... If it's gore and murder that you're looking for, this isn't the film. Unless I said, you know, fish gore is your thing. <laughs> like I said, it's a character study and it's the most in-depth movie or piece of content that I've seen on Dahmer during this period of his life. Did all this stuff actually happen? Who knows? I mean, we're gonna have to take Durf's word for it, I guess. So did I like it? Yeah, I did. <laughs> Will you? I think it kind of depends on your expectations. This is more like an origin story. It'd be like watching Peter Parker suffer through high school, you know, getting beat up by bullies and Flash Thompson. He gets bit by the spider. He witnesses Uncle Ben die. Then he races off to find the murderer and then boom. Credits roll before he ever puts on the Spidey cost. Do yourself a favor though and check out the graphic novel because it is actually quite good. I give my friend Dahmer Seven spoons. I don't make a habit of watching a lot of B films, so maybe I'm just not used to it. But Raising Jeffrey Dahmer is easily one of the worst films I have ever seen. That said, unlike Dahmer vs. Gacy, this does fall into that so bad it's almost good category. And let me tell you why. Released straight to DVD in 2006, at least I'm assuming straight to DVD, if this had a theatrical release, I'd be absolutely shocked and retire immediately from creating any type of content from here on out. <laughs> the film centers on Lionel Dahmer, Lionel Dahmer, Jeff's dad. The majority of it takes place the night that Jeff is arrested in Milwaukee. Hi, Dad. Lionel spends the night barricaded from the press in his home with his wife, Jeff's stepmom, Sherry, and his mother, Jeff's grandma. I can't anymore. The film darts in and out of flashbacks as Lionel searches his memories of Jeff for potential signs of what was to come. He wonders, was it his fault? Was he a bad father? Is he responsible? Okay, that's a, you know, that's a pretty reasonable plot. And there's a book out there written by Lionel himself that's called A Father's Story that tackles all of these questions and more. It's really good. I've read it. This movie, on the other hand, 
is fucking terrible. The acting is laughable. The police? Well, they already looked everywhere. What do they want? The editing is atrocious. Where do you get this? I have no idea. The score is awful. It looks like a pile of dog shit. I mean, I'm not sure if these filmmakers just didn't have access to equipment beyond a Sony Handycam from like 1997. It's listed on IMDb with an estimated budget of 250K. Tiny, minuscule even by Hollywood filmmaking standards, sure. But for this, 250K? What did they spend it on? I mean, certainly not post-production. Look at these flashback scenes. Who looked at this and thought, yeah, these flashbacks look awesome. They're so blown out and grainy, I can barely make out what I'm even looking at. At first, I thought I just found a really low res rip of this film, but no, that's an artistic choice. On the other hand, if you like watching people talk on the phone, then this is the movie for you. There is so much screen time dedicated to phone calls that I actually went back and added it up. 10 minutes. Summer. 10 minutes. The whole movie's only an hour and 20. Right now. And when someone isn't on a phone call, there's also this scene where we just hear an off-camera phone call. Hello? Ooh, riveting. Or this scene where they talk about a phone call. Why wouldn't she answer the phone? Or this scene. Thank you. Where Lionel finishes a phone call. Also, where is that phone plugged in? Must be a pretty long fucking cord. I don't know about you, but I've never seen a landline in someone's backyard before. To top it off, there's this absolutely insane scene where a police detective comes into their home. And you're sitting there you're thinking, okay, he's gonna come in, he's gonna talk to Lionel, he's gonna talk to Sherry about Jeff, he's gonna ask them about like if they had any information about the case or blah, blah, blah. No, 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 he doesn't do that. He tells them the story of his daughter. Why? Who knows? <laughs> Not sure. One day, our daughter just up and left. He tells them what happened to her. We found out that she had gotten killed trying to rob a convenience store in Chicago. I thought you'd, you'd like to know. I'm gonna go now. That's it? <laughs> what was the point to that? Oh wait, there's more. Any what? Wish I could believe that. God. What the fuck was that? Why would the filmmakers just make up this fictional detective? I mean, I looked it up. I could have missed it, but I looked it up. This guy didn't exist. This never happened. Why would they make up a fictional detective that just commits suicide in Lionel's driveway on the night that Jeff was arrested? I mean, it adds nothing to the plot at all. I'm so confused. <laughs> So after all that, I mean, how can I say that this fits into that so bad it's good category? Well, because as far as I can tell, they were trying to make a serious film. <laughs> it's genuine effort here. Dahmer versus Gacy is intentionally bad, at least to some degree. And I mean, that doesn't work for me. Everyone gave their best shot here which makes for some hilarious performances.
I definitely think you should give this one a look. Again, if you can find it. <laughs> I give Raising Jeffrey Dahmer four spoons, but I'm gonna give the editor 10 spoons for dialing in that insanely shitty look for their flashbacks. Lastly, we have the 2002 biopic simply titled Dahmer, starring Jeremy Renner. Hi. Yes, Hawkeye. In one of his very first films, before the Jeremy Renner app, before the weird music career, and before getting run over by his own snowplow. Am I just gonna be like a spine in a, in a brain? But you know, this is just a good movie. It definitely falls into the B movie category still, but it's leagues above both Dahmer vs. Gacy and Raising Jeffrey Dahmer. This film covers the events that we are all most familiar with. The period of time when Dahmer was living in apartment 205 in a Milwaukee low-rise. Right off the top, it tells you that certain characters and events are fictional. And the majority of the film centers around one fictitious night in the apartment with Rodney who to me seems to be loosely based on Tracy Edwards. Tracy, if you remember, is the one who got away and led police back to Dahmer's apartment. I'm kind of making this assumption basically based on like the whole one handcuff scene and What's this? Rodney kind of running away from the apartment. That's about it. <laughs> Through the use of flashback, we're taken back to many of the events we're familiar with throughout Jeff's young adult life. I mean, it ain't a Dahmer film without the usual suspects. The mannequin, hitting trees with sticks, and of course, going to the dump, getting pulled over by police with a dead body in the back. The conversations and interaction between Rodney and Dahmer are carefully and cleverly crafted to give insight into Dahmer's psyche without having to rely on beating us over the head, so to speak, with too much forced exposition. The film does a pretty good job of setting like a creepy and disturbing tone a lot of that is due to the eerie soundtrack choice and red color palette and lighting choices. Sometimes this might be pushed a little bit far though, like really? Like Jeff Dahmer's got a red bathroom, like red lighting in his own bathroom? But I guess, I mean, who knows, maybe. I mean, it is Jeff Dahmer we're talking about. There was obviously a lot stranger things going on in that apartment than just a couple of red lights. The performance from Renner is great. Hey, he even does the accent. It was empty when I found it. I put a few of my own things in it, is that gonna be a problem too, Dad? The guy playing Rodney, however, leaves a little bit to be desired, but I guess you can't have it all. Aunt Tessa was this real beautiful, sophisticated type lady. This movie does have some gore if that's your thing, and it definitely handles it in a more disturbing way that none of these other films match. It also features this very large TV remote. It's a slow-paced, stylized character film more than a gore fest, one that I think is definitely worth the watch. I have it on DVD. Maybe you could get it on Laserdisc. I give Dahmer eight spoons. Okay, so there you have it, people. Four very different Dahmer films. No matter what you're after, you're gonna find it in one of them. I'd love to hear what you thought of this episode. What do you think of my takes on these movies? What do you think of these movies if you've seen them? Is there a Dahmer film that I didn't talk about that I should have a look at? What movies should I review next? Let me know down in the comments below. And as always, don't forget to murder that subscribe button and hit that notification bell because now I have new killer content dropping every week.